All right, so um, we're going to start with prayer, and then and then I'm going to introduce um, Sister Mary and uh, put things into her capable hands. So we, um, it is the um, season of creation during the uh, the month of September into early October. So Sister Mary thought it would be very appropriate um, to pray a prayer for our earth from Pope Francis's Laudato Si. So as we are always in the presence of God, being mindful of that, let us pray. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature. As we journey towards your infinite light, we thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. So as I as I stated earlier, we really um, have the great pleasure of having Sister Mary Sullivan with us this evening. Sister Mary holds a PhD in English from the University of Notre Dame and a master's in theology and Christian doctrine from the University of London. After almost 40 years of full-time teaching and administration in higher education, she is now Professor Emerita of Literature and Dean Emerita of the College of Liberal Arts at the Rochester Institute of Technology. She is author or editor of Catherine McCauley and the Tradition of Mercy, The Friendship of Florence Nightingale and Mary Claire Moore, The Correspondence of Catherine McCauley from 1818 to 1841, The Path of Mercy, the Life of Catherine Macaulay, A Shining Lamp, The Oral Instructions of Catherine Macaulay, and many journal articles on Catherine Macaulay and other figures and topics, including climate justice. Sister Mary was a member of the Mercy International Association Archives Committee from 2001 to 2009 and chair of the Mercy International Research Commission from 2004 to 2009. She is currently an active member of Mercy Focus on Haiti, a Sisters of Mercy initiative in the poorest country of the Western Hemisphere. So Sister Mary, welcome and thank you for being with us this evening. I'm delighted to be with you all. It was a joy to see each new fresh face as you introduced yourself. I can't tell you how much that means to Sisters of Mercy to know we have your companionship and your leadership in the work of the education. I should tell you one thing that's missing from the spiel that Kim gave you. I began my teaching with kindergarten. I taught kindergarten in the morning and went to college in the afternoon. The next year, I taught kindergarten in the morning and fourth grade in the afternoon. The next year, I taught kindergarten in the morning and the sixth grade in the afternoon. Then I taught eighth grade. Then I taught seventh and eighth together. Then I taught in high school. And finally, they got rid of me and sent me off to university. So the only place where I really had any expertise was kindergarten. I was pretty good at it. So if you need a kindergarten teacher, let me know. <laughs> um, we've got a little outline that we'll hope to follow in the course of this evening. Um, I'm going to deal with the first three items uh, rather quickly. <clears throat> then item number four, I'm going to spend more time on and you don't have a text for that. 
In terms of the life of Catherine McCauley, uh, I hope that you find in your office or somewhere, or you can ask some Sister Mercy or somebody else for some copy of a biography of Catherine McCauley. What you have here on the outline is just the salient points. <clears throat> uh, for example, when she was about 25, in 1803, she began to live with a childless, older, and somewhat wealthy couple named Catherine and William Callahan. And they are very important persons in the history of the Sisters of Mercy because when they died, and William Callahan was the last to die, he made Catherine the sole residuary legatee of all their estate, which meant their house, which was a very nice mansion that's still uh, able to be visited today, all the contents of the house, all the contents on the leased land, uh, and stocks, annuities, and property leases. Today, what he left her would be equivalent to about a million dollars. And she could have stayed where she was at Kulak, and she could have enjoyed her Swiss carriage and her black British merino dresses, which you know are the best kind of wool you can get. But instead, she decided to <coughs> build a house in the city of Dublin, a very large house to serve as a shelter for homeless women and as a school for poor barefoot girls. Now, there were a lot of people in Dublin who didn't welcome that idea because Catherine intended they would be a lay community not a religious order. She had no thought about founding a religious order. <clears throat> In fact, she found certain practices of convents repugnant, as you might have a few years ago. Hopefully, we've gotten rid of some of those. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, the parish priest uh, where Bagot Street was located uh, told her that it was mischief trying to assist the clergy in their work. I've always said, good for Catherine. May we have more mischief. But she eventually decided that if they really wanted the works of mercy on Beggett Street to last, they would have to found a new religious order, not an enclosed one, but one where the sister could walk the streets and serve the poor. And so she chose two others to join her in making a novitiate with the presentation nuns. And then on December 12th, a day I'm sure you celebrate in your schools, they profess their vows as the first sisters of mercy. Catherine was a sister of mercy for only 10 years. Sometimes people think she was a sister all her life. But just 10 years, I would say about a year before her death, she began to show the signs of the tuberculosis that eventually took her life. She died on November 11th, 1841. Now that's a quick run through of her life. Uh, it doesn't do justice to all the features and I'm sure you can find books. If you find yourself totally unable to find any long good biography of Catherine McCauley, you let Mesa know and they'll let me know and we'll do something about it, okay? Um, I wanted to spend a little time on some of the sayings of Catherine McCauley. And I wanted to say, if, I don't know if you can see this book, it's kind of dark, 
The title is The Practical Sayings of Catherine McCauley. It's the most authentic collection of Catherine's sayings, the sentences or the paragraphs that she's remembered. Uh, it was prepared by a sister who lived with her at Baggett Street for seven years, Mary Claire Moore. And this, though it's a modern edition, is simply a facsimile of the book that Claire Moore published in 18. 68. So it goes back within 30 years of Catherine's death. The book was in the 1860s reviewed by women who knew Catherine and the sayings in that book are ones you can count on. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the second paragraph there. I know that some of our Mercy Schools have men's students and there's a way in which you can insert men in this paragraph. This paragraph is the fifth paragraph in chapter two of the rule that Catherine co composed. The title of chapter two was The Schools. At the very end of that chapter, Catherine writes, and this is not the whole paragraph five, but the major part of it. No work of charity can be more productive of good to society or more conducive to the happiness of the poor than the careful instruction of women, and you can also put in brackets, and men, than the careful instruction of women since whatever be the station they are destined to fill, their example will always possess influence. And wherever a religious woman or man presides, peace and good order are generally to be found. Now, when Catherine says religious woman, she's not talking about they're a member of a religious order. She's talking about any and every woman or man who is imbued by her or his Christian faith. And such a person will always confer peace and good order by his or her presence. Um, that should be an encouraging paragraph to you. I often feel that teachers go home at night dead tired, but at least they can put their heads on the pillow and feel that they did a good work for humanity that day. Not everybody can go home and say the same thing. So it is uh, a great vocation to be engaged in mercy education. Um, you might look a couple down from that. Catherine's kind of down to earth, practical wisdom. She says, if everyone would mind their own business, the convent would be a heaven on earth. Um, I suppose you could say the same thing of a school or the same thing of a family. If everybody tended to their own affairs, and minded their own business, the place would be a heaven on earth. I want to look at the last saying on this page. To me, it was a key principle of Catherine's life, and I think it's a key principle of the whole Mercy family. She wrote this in a letter to Francis Ward in November 1840. And she said to Francis, while we place all our confidence in God, we must act as if all depended on our exertion. Think of it. You who are leaders of school, you know, at the end of the day, 
Yes, of course, you do have to turn to God and place all your confidence in God, that God will accomplish the good purposes of the school that you're trying to lead. But at the same time, you, we, all of us, have to act as if that were not the case and as if everything depended on our own exertion. In some ways, that's the key principle of the gospel, you know, that we, we know the work of the gospel is God's work. But we are asked to act as if everything depended on our own exertion. Um, I find that a very important statement. I don't know if you want to pause for the moment and ask any questions about Catherine's sayings or about her own life. I have a question. Go, go ahead, Laura. Oh, Laura. Being in a girls' school and a leader of a girls' school, I'm very intrigued by um, Catherine's mentorship of the other women that were uh, she worked with, especially women who were younger than her because of just the power of women working with other women and the, the friendships that she had. Could you perhaps speak a little bit to that? Uh, yes. I, I, can you hear me, Laura? I can hear you. Oh, good. I didn't know if you'd finished your comment or... No, I would just love for you to elaborate on that and you know talk a little bit about her relationships. That really intrigues me. Well, you know, actually, the next element that you got in the materials that came before uh, this evening, Catherine's leadership qualities and methods, it's a little two-page mm -hmm. uh, handout, if you have that. Um, I think that little document that I pulled together one time does talk about exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't use the word mentorship, but it talks about spiritual leadership and the fact that such leadership requires, if you look at the top of the page, at least three efforts on the part of the leader, the energizing of a group or an individual around a worthwhile common purpose, the constant evoking of that vision and dedication to that purpose, and the daily nurturing of other leaders. You're talking about the daily nurturing of other leaders, the daily mentoring of people. And I've tried to list what I think are Catherine's methods of leadership that were conducive to the nurturing of other leaders. I'm not going to comment on all of them. You can read them, but uh, just look at one and two for a moment. The fact Catherine was convinced that we all learn more by witnessing the good example of other people than by their words. And it was her own good example. It is your own good example for others in your school that will be very conducive to their own development. And never underestimate the power of good example. Because you know the negative effect of the opposite. You know, people who are always telling you to do X but they never do X themselves. I think the good example of a mercy school is not only, and of the people in it, the adults in it, the teachers, the staff, the leaders, uh, is also very instructive to the students. You can have a course in the development of leadership for the senior students, 
but it will be your own qualities of leadership that will really teach them. And a second point is related, I think, Laura and others. Don't ever underestimate the importance of your spoken and written words, of what you say to people. And don't be shy about writing to the staff or writing to the students uh, or speaking at assemblies. Uh, we need the guidance and the inspiration and the instruction of others. And Catherine understood that. Or look briefly on page two at item number seven. Catherine constantly put before the First Sisters of Mercy the communal vision and purpose of the congregation. She constantly reminded them of what they were about and what they were together engaged in. And she constantly reminded them that it was not her work they were involved in, nor was it theirs individually, but that it was God's work. And she used to say frequently, if we are humble and sincere, God will finish in us the work he has begun. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the work of a mercy school is God's work, and you are not alone in trying to execute it. God is there, and God is leading it, and God is making it happen. But, as that saying said, you've got to act as if everything depended on your exertion. Um, I'm not going to take the time to read the poem to Elizabeth Moore, but keep in mind that when Catherine founded a new community in Limerick, in southwest Ireland, she asked Elizabeth Moore to be the superior. Now, Elizabeth was very timid and very fearful. She was kind of afraid to go to the door. But Catherine knew she would develop and that she had the basic skills to be a leader. So she spent two months in Limerick kind of encouraging Elizabeth that she would be a good superior in Limerick. And then the morning Catherine left to go back home to Bagot Street in Dublin, she wrote this poem to Elizabeth. And I always imagine she might have left it on Elizabeth's pillow to read after Catherine was gone. And she gives her a lot of good advice. Uh, it won't take long to read it. Let's read it. Don't let crosses vex or tease. I mean, don't get out of shape if something doesn't go right. Try to meet all with peace and ease. Notice the faults of every day, but often in a playful way. And when you seriously complain, let it be known to give you pain. The thing people can't deal with is somebody who seems to be enjoying complaining about the way they do things. Attend to one thing at a time. You have 15 hours from 6 to 9. Uh, you might uh, paint that above your bed or your desk. You can only do what you can do. Attend to one thing at a time. Catherine says you have 15 hours from 6 to 9. She's thinking you get up at 6 a.m. and you go to bed at 9. And maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you have a limited number of hours every day. Be mild and sweet in all your ways. 
now and again bestow some praise. Sometimes we're stingy about praise. And I think that's a very important part of teaching our students, but also mentoring our colleagues. Avoid all solemn declaration, all serious close investigation. Um, the thing a school doesn't really need is a pompous, solemn president or principal or board chair, you know, who pronounces uh, as very serious uh, things that maybe aren't that serious. Turn what you can into a jest, and with few words dismiss the rest. Keep patience ever at your side. You'll want it for a constant guide. <laughs> That's why at the end of our time together this evening, we're going to pray Catherine's prayer for patience. Show fond affection every day. That was certainly one of Catherine's methods, although it wasn't contrived. She simply was very loving to people, and that enabled them to develop into good leaders. Show fond affection every day, and above all, devoutly pray that God may bless the charge he's given and make of you their guide to heaven. Parting advice of your ever affectionate MCM. She never called herself Mother Macaulay. She never called herself Reverend Mother Macaulay. She didn't use the word superior or founder of herself. She was just Catherine Macaulay or Mary Catherine Macaulay because that was the name they took at their uh, final profession in the presentation convent. So her initials, MCM, Mary Catherine Macaulay. Uh, I don't know if that helps, Laura, but um, it's, uh, it, I think it's my best way to describe her mentoring ability. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Good. That's perfect, thank you. Right. Um, I wanna spend a few moments with you focusing very briefly on a widespread problem in our world today and on two very serious manifestations of that problem, both of which I think must be urgent aspects of the mission of Mercy Schools today. The basic problem is the widespread, debilitating, harmful ignorance that affects our human behavior in two crucial areas. But let's focus for a moment on the problem of human ignorance. As you probably know, the Sisters of Mercy throughout the world profess a vow to serve the poor, the sick, and the ignorant. That's the wording of the vow. Now, some sisters for the last 10 years or more have been very uncomfortable with the word ignorant, and they want to substitute the word uneducated. They think that when we say ignorant, we are talking about materially poor people and only about materially poor people, and they don't want to do that. Of course not. But it's not the case that we're talking just about materially poor people. We all know materially poor people who even though they lack some formal education, maybe they have very little, 
they are still not at all ignorant of important aspects of human life. And we all know highly educated people, people with doctoral degrees and other graduate degrees, people in high places who do not understand or value some very important and basic truths about human life and about our presence in this created universe. Because ignorance can affect two aspects of a person or a society. I mean, we can lack uh, certain practical skills or we can lack understanding and appreciation of something really central to human life. Some forms of ignorance aren't very debilitating and they're not harmful or not very harmful uh, to a person or to society. For example, if I don't know how to change a flat tire, and I don't, <clears throat> or how to bake squash, I think I do, the world will not collapse. Probably no one else will suffer by my ignorance, and someone, somewhere, will have the needed skill. But there are forms of ignorance that are very debilitating and harmful to ourselves, to others, and in fact to the whole human family. And all of us need to overcome such harmful ignorance and help others to overcome such ignorance in themselves. I think this is the underlying mission of every Mercy School, and it is an urgent task. When Catherine McCauley opened Bagot Street in Dublin, and later founded the Sisters of Mercy. One of the three forms of ignorance, of human suffering, I should say, one of the three forms of human suffering, which she most hoped to address, was the lifelong disadvantage, the harmfully ignorant vulnerability of poor girls who have no education. That's why in September 1827, when the House of Mercy was first opened, she immediately created a school there for poor barefoot girls. The Christian brothers were already doing the same for poor boys, but no one was educating poor girls. That work of mercy, as well as visitation of the sick and the sheltering of homeless women, led to the founding of the Sisters of Mercy and gave the congregation its distinctive character and mission. Um, so when we talk about mercy charisms, we don't mean, you know, some esoteric thing that you got to find out about. When we speak about mercy charisms, we simply mean the enabling graces, the enabling gifts of God that God always gives to all of us in the mercy family to help us carry on the works of mercy that God asks of us. God asks us to teach and to help heal the ignorance of our students or the public. God 
does not leave us alone with our own resources, but God gives us the enabling gifts and graces for that work. So to talk about mercy charisms, and I think you need to use it in the plural, not the singular, we're not talking about old treasures hidden away in an archival box, you know, as if they were in a museum. We're talking about the constant active enabling gifts of God to, given by God to all who are engaged in mercy ministries. I also want to remind you of a word in, uh, several words, in our constitutions of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas, where we say that we sponsor institutions to address our enduring concerns. And our enduring concerns are these works of mercy. And that within, I'm quoting again, within these institutions, together with our coworkers, we carry out our mission of mercy, guided by prayerful consideration of the needs of our time. Now, the crucial phrase in what I just read is the needs of our time. The needs of our times. The new and crying needs of and sufferings in our time not those of the 19th century, not those of Catherine Macaulay's Dublin, or I should say not just those of Catherine Macaulay's Dublin. Now, if I had to name the most, the two most crucial needs of our time that involve overcoming the debilitating, harmful ignorance, I would name the following. The lack of universal love for all humankind. We see it on television at night. We read it in the paper. We are aware, not just in this country, throughout the world of a growing lack of universal love of all humankind. And the second, and some people would make it the primary, most widespread suffering in our world at this time is the devastation of Earth itself, the devastation of our common Home. If you read it all, you are constantly up against the urgency, the widespread effects of the current climate crisis. When we are ignorant and blind, we are bigoted, we're racist, hateful, violent, or what is equally problematic, we're indifferent, we're neglectful, we're closed toward our brothers and sisters in this world. When we are, and because we are, ignorant and blind, we are currently destroying the very earth and its resources on which we all radically depend for our human lives. We are destroying our water, our air, and our food and the soil on which it is grown. So I don't think I'm 
idiosyncratic in saying that the urgent message, the urgent mission of each and every Mercy School today, if it wishes to faithfully respond to the needs of our times, should focus on overcoming by every means possible the widespread harmful ignorance that is manifested in our lack of universal love of all humanity and in our slow, weak, I would even say anemic response to the climate crisis. I know we talk a great deal about all the mercy critical concerns, and they are all important. But implicit in the notion of universal love of all humanity and in the notion of commitment to care for the earth are all the other critical concerns. But we need to focus. We need to arouse new energy. We need new empowerment. And we need new commitment that will come from a very clear and vigorous focus on these two all-embracing goals. <clears throat> now at this point, you may be quietly saying to yourself, I think I'll start looking for another job. <laughs> but please, please do not say that. We need you and we need your talent. We need you to lead your Mercy Schools to become stellar models of the teaching of universal love and the teaching of genuine and thorough care for the earth. We need our Mercy Schools to be places that focus intently on these human needs, not piecemeal, not occasionally, not once a year on Mission Day, but full time, always. We need you to lead, empower, and energize our Mercy Schools to really serve the ignorant of our day. And I'm not just talking about your students. We need you to serve those who do not understand the obligation of universal love for all humanity. Those who do not understand the necessity of immediate care for the earth and our common home. Our mercy schools need to be famous for these crucial human emphases. Now it's probably clear uh, sufficiently, at least broadly, what I mean when I speak about care for the earth. You can hardly pass a day without seeing an article in the paper or hearing something on television. And if you're really ambitious, you're belonging to environmental organizations that send you petitions every day to sign, or you go onto the United Nations website and read their clear reports on our climate situation. But let me say a few words about universal love of all humanity. Here I simply mean what Jesus of Nazareth meant when he asked us to love one another as he loves us. Jesus did not and does not exclude anyone from his love. 
He doesn't exclude anyone on the basis of skin color, ethnic or religious affiliation, national origin, or any other characteristic. Nor does he exclude some people from our love and care just because they live across an ocean or because they live on a different continent. You might ask yourself, do you go to bed at night worrying about the starving people in Yemen or about the oppressed Rohingya in Bangladesh. Years ago, when we had no internet, no television, no global media, we did not know, or we did not know well, Asians, Africans, Latin Americans. Yes. We knew about African slaves, and we knew some Jews, but most of us had never met a Muslim or a Buddhist. Today, we know, or we know personally, all of them, including the Filipinos, the Navajo Indians, and the indigenous people of the Amazon rainforest. It's almost impossible to read the paper or watch television these days without learning about the suffering of the indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest. The rainforest that is the main lung of the planet Earth the lung that provides 20% of the oxygen we need, now burning. Talk about Earth burning, it's burning. Those in the Amazon and the Filipino and whoever else you wish to name, these two are our brothers and sisters created by our one loving God as members of the one human family. And we cannot ignore them or steal their natural resources. If every human person loved the whole of our human family, there would be no hatred, no racism, no bigotry, no murders, no war, no violence, and no cold indifference, no thinking it's legitimate to ignore some people or relegate certain people to second place and not care about their dignity, rights, or human circumstances. So universal love, love with no exceptions and no exclusions, is the kind of love that Pope Francis is displaying and preaching day in and day out. And it is the kind of love that Mercy Schools need to explicitly teach and explain by every human means. Now I recognize that there will be risks involved in any concerted effort to focus the school's attention on overcoming these two current manifestations of our harmful human ignorance, lack of universal love, and our unloving 
devastation of Earth itself, the common home of the whole human family. I realize that there may be parents or donors who are so devoted to the profitable production and use of fossil fuels that they don't want you influencing their children otherwise. You may have reluctant faculty who don't want to tinker with their course syllabi or be asked to do one more thing. You may have board members or alums who are afraid to confront their own prejudices, afraid to confront their own lack of study, their lack of reading, their lack of understanding, or afraid to confront their own theological maturity, immaturity. You really can't go through life with your eighth grade understandings of theology or your third grade understandings of theology. Or there may be individuals in any one of these groups who have one negative experience or one irrelevant fact that for them decides the whole question. For example, they may say, well, I was once robbed by a Muslim or I was once robbed by a black man. Or they may say, Look, species of animals in the ecosystems regularly go extinct. So that's normal. And there's no present urgent climate crisis. That's what's called climate crisis denial. Or you may have a bishop who, without study, without careful examination of a topic, and without discussion, wants to decide all by himself what's Catholic and what's not Catholic. Schools and their leaders will have to prepare for such risks. In the same way, that we prepare for all other risks. A careful planning, careful wording, respectful dialogue, and prayerful trust in God's guidance. A school committed to the gospel does that anyway. And if it's any consolation, keep in mind that Catherine McCauley herself, in circumstances I won't take the time to describe, was called a cheat and a liar, and by another public person was called graciously offensive. I would say if you're going to be offensive, be graciously offensive. So, a mercy school, by definition, is called to educate, and it will inevitably educate, one way or the other, not only its current students, but all those in its surrounding milieu, all those with whom the school is affiliated, all those in its city and beyond, who will come to know what the school is teaching or doing. So for example, when a school wastes natural resources, 
when it wastes water, when it wastes food in the cafeteria, when it wastes electrical energy, uh, not turning out lights when they're not needed, not getting lead lights for its parking lots, when it wastes those things, the school teaches wastefulness. If all a school ever does for its alums, its donors, or board members is have golf tournaments and cocktail parties, then that is all it will teach them. Now, I'm not against cocktail parties. They're wonderful for socializing. But we have an obligation to our alums that extends beyond their graduation. We have an obligation to those affiliated with the school to enable them to come to understand the things we are trying to teach our students. So I have one final concrete suggestion. What if your school, your whole school, its faculty, staff, and students, and all those affiliated with the school, decided to read or reread together from cover to cover one common book this year. Pope Francis' encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. And what if you then scheduled multiple discussion groups and events, and everyone participated in one of those discussion groups, each group having a mixture of participants? Just imagine what this intergenerational learning would do to overcome some of our harmful ignorance about the necessity to care rather than devastate earth. Common home. And implicitly about our need to really love all humanity. And then next year, Everyone could read Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Just think about it. Think about the educative power of that mercy witness. Try somehow tonight to engage you in crucial mainstream mercy matters. Response to two critical needs of our times. I also want to offer you my help in any way you may need or want it. I believe in the profound value of the work you've taken on and I truly stand ready to help in any way I can. And Mesa knows how to get in touch with me. Beth McCauley hoped that all of us in our global Mercy family and all our institutions would be shining lamps, giving light to all around us. And I think we and our Mercy Schools will be shining lamps, giving light to all around us by what we teach and by the way we teach it. And I want you to be assured of one more thing. Catherine McCauley will daily accompany you. That is her current merciful ministry among us.
and from that work she will never retire. So call on her often. I think she would love that. Thank you very much for your time and for the inspiration and dedication of your lives. Now, I don't know, I guess we do have a little time left for comments, questions, agreements, disagreements, uh, uh, anything you want to ask. If I don't know the answer, I'll say I don't know. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Sister Mary? While you're thinking up your questions, you know, I don't think we can stress enough the absolute urgency of our putting our shoulders to the wheel about mitigating the climate crisis. I know it's a big undertaking. I know the learning that we all need to do, but it, to, to ignore it or to treat it as something, well, we'll get around to it next year, or to do a couple of little ecological things and then think we've done with it. It's just not adequate. It won't be adequate. I mean, I try to avoid plastic bags. I try to recycle, but I mean, that's not enough. We all have to be in this and all our institutions have to be in it. Thank you, Sister Mary. Does anyone have any uh, final comments or questions? Remember, you have to unmute yourself. Does anybody okay. have any complaints? <laughs> So allow me to uh, thank Sister Mary, and then I'm going to have Sister Mary um, read Catherine's prayer for, for patience so we can end, end with that. So um, on behalf of Mesa and all of our Mesa schools, Sister Mary, thank you so much for being with us this evening and for sharing your tremendous knowledge and wisdom about Catherine and the Mercy Charism uh, for strengthening our knowledge of Catherine's background for highlighting uh, many of her, her own words of wisdom and, and practical sayings and suggestions for reinforcing Catherine's leadership qualities so that we can you know, use them as models in our own leadership. And also the way that she developed um, leaders and, and how she you know, uh, built relationship, as Laura was asking, built relationship with her sisters and also for really um, bringing home that urgent need that we all have as, as mercy, people of mercy, as mercy leaders to really act on, the, on the, uh, the needs of our times today. So we are eternally grateful. Um, I, I wanna thank all of you leaders. I know these are very long days, especially at the beginning of school. Um, so thank you for taking the time to be on the call this evening and for all all of the, the wonderful work that you're doing um, at our schools for our students and for the whole community. So thank you. And as Sister Mary said, um, just as she is here to support, so is the Mesa staff. So please do not hesitate to, to contact us if you need anything. So with that, Sister Mary, do you wanna end with uh, Catherine's prayer for patience? Uh, yes, I just want to um, say where this prayer came from. I used to think that Catherine composed it from scratch 
It's written in her handwriting in the front of her prayer book, the title of which <clears throat> was Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And that prayer book is in the archives on Bagot Street in Dublin. But then I discovered that a book that I know she read to the community, uh, actually a, a late 17th century, early 18th century book by an Englishman, John Gother, the title of which is The Sinner's Complaints to God. It's not a very appealing title, but the word complaints simply means prayers. Uh, Catherine copied this prayer, uh, about two-thirds of it, out of one page in Gother's uh, book, and then she copied the rest of it out of uh, another page. She evidently liked the prayer. She thought that she lacked patience. She was a doer. She was not afraid to do new things. She was a mover. We might say a mover and a shaker. And, you know, some members of the community uh, thought she rushed ahead. So there were moments when Catherine felt she lacked patience. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think patience is a virtue that all school leaders need. Most of all, patience with themselves. I mean, remember again, you have 15 hours from 6 to 9. Uh, and patience with staff and students. So it's... It's a prayer in language that Catherine McCauley used and in language that she actually wrote on a blank sheet. So with that, tonight, I am praying with and for you, and you are praying with, for yourself, I trust, and for the rest of us. So let us pray. I come this day to ask of thee, my God, the virtue and the divine gift of patience, which is so necessary to carry me through the difficulties of my charge and to satisfy the many duties which are enjoined me by thy command. I here confess my great weakness in this point. There not being any day which does not convince me how much I want what I now ask. And therefore I earnestly beg of thee that grace. And according to my necessity, May my prayer so proceed from my heart as to induce thee, my God, to grant my petition. May the spirit of the cross carry me on and support me under all my trials. And in this same spirit, may I surrender my soul into thy hands. O blessed Jesus, stand then by me. Show mercy to thy servant and powerfully help me. Amen. Well, thank you again, Sister Mary, and thanks to all of you and I uh, wish you uh, a safe and blessed evening. So everyone take good care.